The current social role of architects, planners, urban practitioners is a, is a very difficult question because it has changed dramatically uh, over the last 30 years or so. There used to be, particularly after the Second World War, and as part of the, the welfare state formation and strengthening, there used to be such a thing as the, the state architect, the state planner, or the, the city architect, the city planner. And they were vested with enormous power, uh, but there was also enormous opportunity in that power. The withdrawal of the welfare state, I think, had this perverse effect on architecture as well, in the sense that architecture and planning, to a certain extent, has lost this social role, mainly because it stopped being state-funded, partly. And it became even more incapacitated to uh, put forward a new vision. And many, many, many architects and planners and urban practitioners do put forward visions at the theoretical level. Uh, but of course, very few, if any of them, have the opportunity nowadays to turn those in, into built form. What we see uh, by contrast is, we're all familiar with that, this insurgence of the iconic architect, the iconic building, the star architect, etc. And we see cities across the world being funded by the same uh, capital streams and designed by the same range of global architectural practices. And there's nothing inherently wrong with this as such. I don't want to criticize, I don't want to enter criticism of the process, but the actual effect on the ground is that it produces what I have termed autistic architecture. I mean, it has been recorded to name names. Uh, Rafael Vignoli, for example, was building something in Moscow. And when he, he was interviewed about how he thought his new building would fit into uh, Moscow, how, how, what he thinks of Moscow the city. So his response was that uh, Moscow the city he doesn't really know very well. He has seen it, he has read something in books, etc., etc. But he knows what Rem Kohlhaas was building next to him and he thought um, the dialogue between the two would be uh, okay and would bring new you know, kind of buzz in the area, blah, blah. So in fact, if we talk, if we're talking about a new set of uh, transnational elites that move from place to place and build from place to place in dialogue amongst themselves. And in, uh, it's, that's what I call autistic. They, they ignore what actually is happening on the ground. Even the city itself exists somewhere out there. And it's a promotion of that singular architectural object. And this is the process that has led to uh, the urban skyline has become a kind of fetish nowadays to urban planners, urban authorities, etc. Every urban authority is now pursuing the best skyline, the most impressive skyline. And there's an increasing disconnect between the skyline and what's actually the city on the ground, the street level, the eye level, the level that we live in. In um, a recent work I did uh, in the city of London and the new iconic buildings there, we interviewed a hundred people in the city of London and we had them all draw cognitive maps following Lynch's uh, methodology. So they drew cognitive maps, so mapping from mind uh, how they perceived the city of London. It turned out that like 80% of them could not place the gherkin on the map. So it was something that was existing, you know, up there, uh, but they couldn't relate to it in the everyday experience. They didn't even know where it stood. And that's also partly because this new so-called iconic buildings, because of specific planning, regulations, etc., cetera, um, but also because of the, the way they are designed, they kind of almost land uh, with complete, sometimes with complete disregard of what's happening around them. Uh, so they are, they do not engage with urban space as such in their vicinity. So uh, in my work, I talk about architecture as um, a social, a radical imaginary, as a totem, a, a totem that 
tells society what to desire and how to desire it. This is why, you know, since time immemorial, architecture, architects have been the luckies of the prince or the emperor, or this is why, you know, from the Egyptians uh, to Hitler, to Tony Blair, to whoever, you name it, any state authority or power wanted to build something iconic. Because architecture has that power to symbolize something that is not even there socially yet. Again, referring to the work I did on, on the city of London, the new sprouting skyscrapers in the city of London were highly contested, highly debated, because the city of London used to be governed by conservation practices. And suddenly we saw this enormous shift in the policy and practice of planning in the city of London. And this has been seen as a, a demonstration of power of the city. It was becoming global, even more global than it was. To, but in my work, and I documented, those buildings are not demonstrating existing power. They're actually demonstrating a crisis in the, in the identity and function of the city of London. These, these buildings were put there at a moment when the city of London itself is an ancient, uh, very powerful local authority. It's a state, I call it London's Vatican. It's a state within the state, literally. So those buildings started sprouting the moment when the city of London was threatened to be abolished by the, the British state or change. So those buildings were, came up as totems signifying uh, the power of the city of London and the emergence of a new uh, set of actors, a new set of elites that were going to transform the, the city. So these uh, skyscrapers were indicators of a crisis, not of old and existing power. So I think this role of architecture as a totem is very important in order to understand why uh, we collectively of course, architects, we are fascinated with architects, but also everybody's fascinated with, with good architecture. There's no doubt about that. And why there is this will to fund from the part of elites powerful architectural objects that will stand in for telling people what you're going to desire now and how you're going to desire it. I mean, it, it's again, I, I'm, I'm drawing upon my work in London because that's, the, that's what I, it's more recent. It, it's very interesting to see how the gherkin was much hated originally by the British public and how now, how much loved it is now. Not by everybody, but still. But if we go back, uh, I think it's very important to historicize and put historical context in our contemporary understanding of architecture. Uh, we, we should not forget that the Eiffel Tower was so hated by the French public when it came up that they were going to take it down, right? But after having stayed there for a while, it became embedded in the, in the public imaginary as part of the Parisian uh, landscape, the Parisian skyline, and it literally told uh, the Parisian public what to desire and how to desire it, what type of building to like and why. Uh, so it was a, a radical shift in the aesthetic uh, perception of what an urban icon could or should be. And of course, it was standing as the totem of modernity. It was standing not only for new construction materials and construction methods, it was st standing for a whole era that was emerging forcefully, uh, you know, hammering down all the old ways of doing, of building, of thinking, of trying to change everything in the process. <laughs>